and will level the mountains. I will break down the gates of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by name. Now keep in mind, Cyrus is not yet to be born for another couple hundred years. God calls him by name, says exactly what he's going to do. God is going to go ahead of him and remove obstacles so that he does things that no one's ever done before, so that no one will have any doubt who God is. Now, those of you who are children of God, when God calls upon you and ordains you to do something, he will go ahead of you and remove the obstacles so that it will be accomplished. And oftentimes, these things that take place are not things that we can do ourselves, but things that only God can do. That way, he affirms us in the doing of them that God's power is in it. If we only did things that were in our power, it would only affirm things that we can do. But God does things that only God can do so that he grows us in our faith in an understanding that God will equip and empower and give you the resources to do the things that he has planned for you. Cyrus needed this assurance. Cyrus was not a Jew. Cyrus was not a member of the nation of Israel. Cyrus was a pagan king. Just as 70 years prior to this, Nebuchadnezzar was a pagan king. These texts teach us that God is the ruler of all kings in all lands at all times. God works for up about his purposes. There are many times that we as believers question, what in the world is God doing? Now, some people may have questioned with our last president, what in the world is God doing? And some people might be questioning with the president we have now, what in the world is the Lord doing? But I guarantee you, God will bring about all of his purposes so that everything that he prophesied about himself and his people will be fulfilled. As we read this text, it foreshadows exactly what this man is going to do, and then for the next verses, all the way down through verse 13, it basically gives this argument. Does a pot argue with a potter and say, why did you make me this way? Come to that for a second. Does the pot say to the potter, why did you make me this way? Why didn't you make me this way? Does a child argue with his father and say, What have you begotten? Or to his mother, What have you brought to birth? So God is demonstrating that he is the one in charge. He is the one in control. He is the one that ordains kings. He is the one that directs history so that things come about according to his will and his plan, and Cyrus is his chosen man for this day. What's he going to do? He's going to take the people that he has punished for their disobedience for this period of time, and he is going to miraculously deliver them back into their land, give the land back to the people, rebuild the temple so that they can worship God again. Now, Imagine this for a moment. The people of Israel were so corrupt that in the temple of God, they had the Holy of Holies where they worshipped Yahweh. And on the other walls, they had symbols for hundreds of other gods right in the temple. So imagine this place today. We've got a cross. But then we have a symbol for Satan worshippers. And then we have a symbol for sun worshippers. And then we have a symbol for people that worship Allah. And then we have a symbol for people that worship Buddha. And then a myriad of Hindu gods. So people that would come to church would work, get all the bases covered. Now, given the fact that God has revealed from the beginning of creation until this day that there is only one true living God, you might think that this might be just a little bit offensive to that one God, wouldn't you? And so God, through the prophet Ezekiel, told them that this place was going to be leveled. If you were that disobedient to God, if you sinned that greatly against God, would you think that God would never forgive you? The answer is yes, if you believe the word of God. 
Because God told them, even before the temple was destroyed, that he was going to rebuild it from the prophet Isaiah. And there you get people like Ezra and Nehemiah and champions of the faith that have never forgotten what God has said. And that when they're in that dark time, when they're in that captivity, when things aren't going right, when they feel like God has turned their back on them and that he doesn't remember them anymore, they claim the word of God, they hold it fast in their heart, and they say, I believe. And you should too. And it comes to pass. And God brings about a revival and a restoration to his people when they trust in his proclaimed word. So, the, the title of the message is From Prophecy to History. Because God tells us in advance a lot of things that he's going to do, and then we, as people, study what God did, and they were historical events that actually took place. In the same way in the Old Testament, I want to speak specifically to people who have questioned the authority of God and his word. Those of you who have wondered whether or not you should put your trust in God, isn't it amazing that God would give the very name of a person long before that they were born exactly what they were going to do, and that person would be the most powerful king on the entire earth at that time? Isn't that amazing? The Lord did the same thing with the Lord Jesus Christ. He prophesied a number of different things. He prophesied in Micah 5 2 that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, just like he was. Judges 13.5 said that he would be a Nazarene. Well, typically, when you're born in a town, that's the town you live in. That's not a town that's a long ways away. He would be called a Nazarene because that's actually where he was from. He just happened to be born in Bethlehem because Mary and Joseph had to travel there to register for a census by a secular king that wanted to count the people up. So God used the secular king to do a decree for everybody to go to their hometown so that they could go there for a census, and that happened to be where Jesus was born. So he was born in Bethlehem. He was called a Nazarene. He was called out of Egypt, Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. Another prophecy about Jesus. Now, did, did Micah and Hosea and these people that were in the days of the judges, did they know each other? Were they next to each other? Did they have insights? No. All these words come from God. How was he called out of Egypt? Well, there's another prophecy. Jeremiah chapter 31, 5. That prophecy spoke of that there would be great wailing in Rome. Now, many of you know that there was a secular king named Herod that when he found out that the king of the Jews was born, had a decree. And that decree was that everyone that was, every male child that was under two years old would be put to death because he was afraid of this future king of the Jews. But God warned Mary and Joseph in a dream what Herod was going to do, and so they fled to Egypt. And after Herod died, they came back. So how is it that one prophet could say that he's going to be called out of Egypt, another one that he's a Nazarene, another that he's born in Bethlehem, and another that there would be great wailing in Ramah, the region of Bethlehem where he was born. Is it predictable? See, some people when they interpret prophecy think that surely these things have to be figurative because it's not going to literally happen. But friends, the 300 prophecies that had to do with Jesus' birth, life, death, and resurrection that are in the Old Testament, all were fulfilled literally. They were fulfilled literally. So when God says something, we can take confidence that he is going to carry it out. Just like he's done before. So it's my prayer that as we look at Ezra and we see these acts that took place in history, that we see God's will actually unfolding amongst his people. Now we go back to Ezra, chapter 1. First of all, Cyrus, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, Jeremiah also prophesied these things. The Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make proclamation 
draw this around. Now, just to connect another dot, when the people that were in Jerusalem were brought into captivity out of the land to Babylon, there was a certain God whose name was Daniel that was brought along. Now, fast forward a bit. Daniel now, after a series of kings, is now the prime minister to Cyrus. So there is a God aligned, a prophet of God, to live right alongside of these kings that he's using to proclaim the word of God to them so they know what to do. Pretty awesome. But here it says the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus. Now we don't know that the Lord moved his heart through the words of Daniel. Or if God moved his heart direct. But I want you to know today that God moves our hearts for things. Later in the text, too, he says, for everyone that the Lord moves, the Lord moves us. Sometimes, when we're in the wrong place at the wrong time, the Lord moves us to get our attention. Sometimes, when we're in the right place at the right time, the Lord moves us, and he directs our paths to do various things. This last weekend, the retreat with the young people, we recounted the story of the Good Samaritan. Many of us know it. Some of us know it by heart. In that particular story, there was a man that was injured alongside the road. And the priest, when the priest came along, the person that was injured, he passed along the other side of the road. And, and why did that happen? Maybe because he was bloody and dirty, and if he touched it, he would be unclean, and he couldn't do service to God. The Levite passes along. The Levite, he comes along. And maybe he had some of the same thoughts. Maybe he had some place to go. Maybe they, they were supposed to serve God at the temple, the Levites. He probably had to go to work for God. You see, many times the Lord directs us, speaks to our hearts to do something while we are on the way to do something that we plan. Something that we intend to do. But if we have learned anything from the historical books of God, God moves his people to do the things that God wants us to do. And sometimes that's a difficult process. God moved him, and he was obedient in it. So one of the lessons we have already is God's faithfulness. We've already seen, great is thy faithfulness. God is faithful to do what he says he's going to do. As we saw him standing on the promises, I hope that you know some of these promises so that you know the way God acts towards us. There are days when we feel guilt and shame for doing things that are not God's will. And God's word says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. He will cleanse us from our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Do you know that promise? That you can claim for yourself? So that you don't have to be ridden with guilt? God speaks of his restorative power and his grace and his mercy in fulfilling his promises. I've had conversations with people that feel like they really shouldn't even pray because of things that they've done in the past. But look what the people of Israel did. Consider that for a moment. Look what they did. And look at God's faithfulness. He, God might discipline for a time that he always comes back with mercy and grace to his people. God has not forgotten us, no matter what we might think. Down to verse 5 in chapter 1 of Ezra. Then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin, just know the family heads of all the tribes of Israel are not listed, just those two tribes, because this was the southern kingdom, not the northern kingdom. And the priests and the Levites, so those are the descendants of the people that are working in the temple, everyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. And God still moves our hearts today. Verse 6, all their neighbors assisted them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with valuable gifts, in addition to all the free will offerings. So, the people that were Israelites that were living in this area of Babylon, which is modern-day Iraq, about 600 miles from Jerusalem, the neighbors who were not 
Jews that were returning, were compelled by the edict of the king and moved by the heart of God to give offerings to help equip them for the journey so that they could get the job done. God uses people that are not even his to accomplish his purposes. Verse 7, Moreover, King Cyrus brought out the articles belonging to the temple of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and had placed in the temple of his God. So God reclaims the temple furniture and articles, the, the cups and the plates and all the stuff that they used for worship, that Nebuchadnezzar had taken, and they were, they were gold and silver and that kind of stuff, Nebuchadnezzar had taken them, put them in the temple of his God. All those articles are still there. They weren't destroyed with the temple because usually when you destroy something, you sack all the good stuff first. So the king orders all of the stuff that was in the temple to be brought back to the temple so that after it's built, it can be put in its spot. Verse 8, Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought by Midrath, the treasurer, who counted them out to Shezbazar, the prince of Judah. And then an inventory is given of how many bowls and dishes. Anyone ever take inventory? I grew up with my dad having a sporting goods store. I hated taking inventory. Back then, you had to count everything, now they do with scanners. But they had a good inventory. They, they had down to the down to the bowl, down to the silver pans. They they, they brought it out. In all, there were five thousand four hundred articles of gold and silver. Chesbazar brought all these things along when the exiles came up from Babylon to Jerusalem. So here's some applications. We've spoken of God's faithfulness to His people. <coughs> When you're in a difficult spot, sometimes it's hard to see how the hand of God is working. Let's, let's say you're six years prior to Cyrus being born, and you've lived with some pretty dark days in your life, and you haven't seen God's blessing, and you only heard about what happened before. Be encouraged, even in your difficult situation, that the Lord is faithful. The Lord hasn't forgotten you. Second, we find God's sovereignty. God is in control. He's over kings. Sometimes we can get very, very discouraged and depressed when we watch the news. Can you relate to this? We see all the stuff that's happening in the world. And we think, this is, this is terrible. How is the world ever going to come out of this? Well, God's word, by his prophecy, prophecy tells us how the world is going to come out of it. <coughs> And our greatest fear ought not be armies. Our greatest fear ought not be global warming. Our greatest fear might not be this individual king or this individual country or this individual person. The greatest fear that we ought to have is for the living God who has the power to give life or death. When we are right with him, how we end in this life is inconsequential. I prayed earlier in the service for uh, Brittany DeBrew's grandfather. He was a man that was among the greatest generation that has been called by Tom Brokaw. World War II veteran, there's not a lot of those left anymore. He was a man that served our country, but more importantly, he was a man that served the living God. And so when we mourn, we, we listen to God's word that says to believers, you are not to mourn like the rest of the world. Why? Because we have hope that those who die in the Lord are with Him. We don't mourn the same. Because we believe in the faithfulness of God and we believe in the sovereignty of God and that a mere death in this life is not our end. Amen? Later this week, I'm doing a funeral for my aunt. I, I appreciate your prayers for this, because when I, have, when I have the opportunity to minister to my own family, it's a great joy to me, because not all of my family know the Lord. I know that there will be those present when I bring the message that do not walk with Jesus or know Him. 
And there's been a lot of discussion. Some of you know that my aunt perished in a fire. Her and the tenant when their house burned down. A lot of the conversation that's been rumbling through the family is how much did she suffer? The fire is not the way to go. How many of you would choose that as your first pick? No one? Me neither. It'd probably be the last pick I've got is fire. I burnt my finger before. It's very unpleasant. The pain is terrible. And I understand to a certain degree the, the, the question, how much did she suffer before she died? Did she die of smoke inhalation first or did she perish in the flames screaming? And we can't answer that. We weren't there. I don't know how much suffering she endured. But this I do know, that her suffering was temporary. And that she put her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And she's not suffering today in flames. That I know. So we hold fast to God's word when we endure difficulty. Who of us doesn't ask these questions when we have like little Christian with the stuff that's going on inside of his body that might be cancer, we, we cry out to God and we say, we're at, very, at least very tempted to say, why? I don't understand what is going on. Why would he do this? We have a child that's born with terrible handicaps and, man, just walking through children's hospital. I hate that. I love that place and I hate it at the same time. You know what I mean? I love the people there that care, man, the love and the care that they give children is awesome, but man, I can barely walk through the place without tears. But when we see the difficulties and the pain of this life, that is right alongside a faithful God who also knows the penalty of sin, who sent his son, Jesus, to die for that penalty so that sin would not have the final word for us took away the sting. And we see God's sovereignty through the ages weaving actions of pagan kings and godly men and women to bring about his purposes so that his children would be blessed and know him. Another application in this text. God moves us in the spirit. My prayer for all of us is that we would be walking in such a way with God that when he says, you see that guy alongside the road, I want you to take care of him. Even though you had plans for that day, you make a call, you do what you have to do, but you listen to God when he says, help. Just like many of you did last week, your hearts were moved when Colleen asked for help and you showed up with your feet and your hands and love in your heart and you did it. And it is a joy to serve God when you listen to when he moves your heart. <coughs> and lastly, from this text, another application. When God asks you to do something, he's going to provide. He provides. Some of us have fear about sharing Christ with other people. Jesus sent out his disciples and they had the same fear. And one of those fears is, what am I going to say? Uh, 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 uh. And he said, trust in me, for the Spirit will give you the words. So you might not know exactly what you're going to say, but you do it because God says to do it. And in the midst of time, sometimes the things that come out of your mouth are things that you would have never even thought of. And when those things come out of our mouth and someone is moved and touched and ministered to by God... It's just so awesome when the Spirit of God moves through you to touch other people. And it's fun. And it's a blessing. How blessed are we to have the Spirit of God move through us to touch other people? When other people in the world are going about their own way, doing their own thing, saying, God, take a hike. I'm only going to do what I want to do for my good pleasure. And then there's us. <coughs> I pray us is inclusive. I'm praying everybody here that you know Jesus and that you listen to him. <coughs> and that sometimes you take a step of faith and you, you, you go.
go to do something and you don't even have the resources to do it, but you trust God and He provides. And this passage has a, a ring of familiarity, doesn't it? When the people were in exile under Moses, under the days of Moses in Egypt, and God called the people out, they were slaves, they were poor, they didn't have anything but dirt. And God says, I can work with this. And he so compelled the people in Egypt, the people of Egypt were so afraid of the living God that, that decimated the battle between the gods of Egypt and the living God. They were just scared to death, literally, after the death angel passed and killed all their firstborn, of the living God. And when God said, let my people go, they finally said, okay. You need any resources for this trip? They dug deep into their accounts and they gave gold and they gave all kinds of food and, and animals and they, they financed the trip. And when God finances the trip and he makes it happen, we say, only God can do this. Man, our God is great. Our God is great. He's sovereign. He's faithful. He moves us. And he provides. Amen? Join me in prayer. God, when we see what you have done, we get very, very excited about what you're going to do. Because we know that you haven't changed a bit since Ezra walked the earth. That you are the same God, that you don't change. That seasons change, but you never do. And it's a joy to know you, oh God. Thank you for revealing yourself to us. Help us to know you more. Help us to know your word more. Help us to be like Ezra that just loves everything about your word because it teaches us who you are and the way you work and what you've done and what you're going to do. Lord, we praise you for being God who are. And we pray, especially in dark days when it seems like you're far away, that we would remember that you have not forgotten us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand. And on the back side of your sheet, there's a song, How Great Is Our God. And if you want to place that in your hymnal, at hymn number four, we're going to go from How Great Is Our God to God, How Great Thou Art. We're going to sing both songs. Praise the God of heaven that inspired Cyrus to his heart. And we're going to praise the same God that was ours to get Let's stand together. <laughs>
entitled Messages from Prophecy to History. We've read today the things that God began to do in the days of Adam. He told his people what he was going to do, and then he did it. And they saw the unfolding of it. And our great God has also told us what he was going to do later in history. And the Lord Jesus Christ said that you, you tear down this temple, meaning his body, and I will raise it up in three days. And Jesus did, as he said. And just as we put faith in what God said he is going to do, and, and actually did that, and returned back to his father, the prophecy of the Lord's second coming, and the prophecy of us seeing him, him face to face, will one day be history too. May all of you know this God that keeps his word. That you would know his faithfulness, that you would know his promises, so that you can claim them even through your darkest days. That we would walk with him, have him move our heart to faithfulness to this almighty great God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.